Uh, good morning. First off, I'd like to thank the folks at, at ASEO for inviting me here today. Um, and thank you for challenging me, at least to, as we say, set the stage for a lot of today's discussion. Right, as we was mentioned already, where focus really is trying to understand this frontier of the intestine and really this dichotomy, if you will, in nutrient supply and what we know, at least, in terms of how it responds as a barrier function. I think the main thing I want you to take from my message, one, is to set the stage for the rest of our speakers this morning and this afternoon, but two, to realize that the intestine is what we call a very plastic organ. It responds to the environment to which it has to, in terms of nutrient, in terms of ingredient supply, and in terms of challenges that are presented to it, either from pathogens or other types of substances that cause it to respond. Now, as Mingan mentioned, in general, we think of the intestine as a very large maintenance type of organ system. It requires essentially one out of every five calories for maintenance. If we think of it from turnover of protein, it turns over at a rate of 50 to 75% per day. And one out of every four calories produced, or one out of every four proteins produced by the body is synthesized and really secreted into the gut. And these are very general types of maintenance numbers, if you will, and they readily change, again, as that dynamic of the intestine is put forward. So we're going to hear a lot about those different types of functions and adaptations throughout today as to what those responses by the intestine are. So as an example, if that intestine has a, a pathogen affecting it, its response is going to be to try and rid the body of that pathogen more quickly. So the way that it does that, it changes rate to peristalsis. We get reductions in the amount of dry matter that's actually absorbed by the body. If a cell or an enterocyte is infected, its response is to essentially move up the rate of turnover of that tissue and try to replenish those, those uh, effective enterocytes more quickly. The secretory immune response is going to be upregulated to try to produce more mucin to try and move things more quickly through the digestive tract. We see changes to overall functions and cellular and transport functions in the name of paracellular barrier proteins, changes to secretions, changes to gene expression. And we'll also hear later on this morning about some of those immunological influences and microbiological influences and alterations that are affecting. So I want you to realize that this is a very dynamic system. And it's very hard to ascribe a singular type of response. And this response will be changing. And that's why I think a number of different people throughout the scientific community have begun to essentially try and look at this very complex system and complex reaction. And I'm happy to see a number of collaborations across disciplines beginning to occur much more than what we have seen in the past. So for my presentation, I'd like to just go through a few of those ascribed functions, as you see here, to the intestinal tract, and just give you some examples of those dynamics that are actually occurring. So again, all of these changes really change then, as we saw in the very first slide, the protein and energy demands for that tissue. So first of all, let's, let's think about this change in peristalsis. It's challenged by different pathogens. It's going to change the rate of reaction. So I put up this slide just as an example of one of those challenges that we tend to see um, and realize that the change in response by the intestine to any pathogen is really going to be dependent upon load of the pathogen, virulence of the pathogen, and we also see variance in responses across individuals within that population. So it's very hard to ascribe and predict as a nutritionist what I need to supply because we never know those three things. 
the load of the pathogen, the virulence of that pathogen, and how that individual is going to respond. So as an example, just to give you changes in digestibility that may occur due to presence of a pathogen, one of the ways we used to do this in our lab was just by using a coccidial vaccine. And what you see here is a 12 times normal dose of a coccidial vaccine given at 14 days of age, and we made our measurements at 21 days of age. If you see on the energy side here, we see a dramatic reduction in the amount of energy use by the animal. If we look at the, on the, the right-hand side of this graph, the white bars indicating the dry matter digestibility reduction, roughly from about 75% down to about 60%, and our nitrogen, apparent nitrogen retentions from about 65% down to below 40%. And I mentioned this, and I'm going to come back to this particular study as we move through the presentation, just to reiterate, reiterate some of the examples of where we're looking at what is happening. So as we think about this, focus mainly now on that change in dry matter digestibility alone. Going back to the change in peristalsis and moving things more quickly through the digestive tract. If nothing were to change in terms of absorptive epithelia, we do get this change, at least then, in dry matter retention. The other thing that became interesting as we looked at this particular challenge, we were trying to ascertain changes to standardized amino acid digestibilities, and with that, what change in endogenous amino acid production and flow was happening within the digestive tract. So I put this just more as an example of what was occurring, and you'll get a chance to look at this a little bit later on in the presentations, and you can pause and take a look at that. But I just wanted to get you a flavor of what is happening. What seems strange to me as I put this slide up here, I was expecting the endogenous amino acid production and flow to essentially be higher in the challenge state versus the non-challenge state. In fact, the reverse was actually true. We had a 20 to 40 percent reduction in the terms of being present with the challenge across our essential amino acids. But I think the thing that is important to point out is that our measure is per unit of dry matter intake, right? So our endogenous amino acid production per unit of dry matter intake was going down. Let's relate that then to what that means, at least in terms of standardized amino acid digestibility, essentially taking into account that basal endogenous amino acid flow. Again, our dry matter is going through more quickly, right, on a per unit basis. That was a little bit less in terms of uh, endogenous amino acid flow, but our digestibility was going down at least by about 15 to 20 percent. So when we go to a correct for that on a standardized ileal digestible basis, you can see that we have a dramatic change, at least, in terms of amino acid digestibility. And here I only put the essential amino acids. Dr. Kidd will talk a little bit later on this morning about how some of those in particular are responding. The one thing I think is critical to, to understand, if we're thinking about the ideal amino acid concept, that ideal protein may change as we're going forward to respond to some of these challenges, right? We know that the acute phase proteins, and I'll talk about them a little bit later on, the profile of those changes during the course of an innate immune response and that response to respond to some of these challenges and invasions within the digestive tract. And as you look at some of those that are are more rate limiting, you can see that that total, at least from a digestible standpoint, changed quite dramatically. And this is the numbers here as a percent of the overall diet. Again, back to that particular level and a response with that particular challenge. So one of the things, if you've seen me give talks before, I really like to, to understand and challenge dogma, if you will. And one of those dogmas out there really is that the turnover of an epithelial cell within the intestinal tract, you ask anyone, typically they will tell you two days, 
So I wanted to go back in history of why we think that is essentially two days. And the sad thing is our dogma really comes down to one chicken from the 1960s. So I wanted you to understand where some of this is coming from because this is a very dynamic system and that change that happens is very dynamic. So if we think about this epithelial turnover, really to renew the epithelial surface, we need to produce new cells through mitotic division. As those cells mature, they differentiate along the, the crypt villus axis before they essentially go through programmed cell death and are sloughed into the, the lumen of the digestive tract. And this process of birth, growth, and death is essential to the integrity of that epithelial surface. So here's that paper, that one chicken that made history, right? So what they did, Amandi and Bird back in 1966 essentially injected tritiated thymidine into the peritoneum of the gut and then began harvesting birds at different points in time. And as you would expect, those labeled cells through autoradiography began to be labeled and move up the length of that crypt villus axis. So essentially, they took birds at 3, 8, 18, 24, and 48 hours after injection of that tritiated thymidine and collected samples from the duodenum jejunum and ileum. And I know this is probably very small for the people in the back of the room, so I apologize. But the one thing to realize is that 48 hours, 87% the, the cells had traversed 87.5% along the, the length of the jejunum. And the summary in the abstract, and that's what a lot of us tend to focus on, said that nearly all of it had been gone in the terms of the jejunum by the end of 48 hours. But again, realize that going back to the statistics, each of these time points represented one bird. So a lot of our dogma, at least, did not focus on the duodenum or ileum, but it focused on the jejunum because that 48-hour time point most of the, the length of the cryptvillus axis had been traversed. So, that one famous chicken. I tend to think of this a little bit more, and, and I wanted to present this because it is a very dynamic system. And to actually calculate the overall turnover is really what we need to begin thinking of. If we look at the duodenum in this very healthy chicken, it was taking 5.2 days in the duodenum, to turn over 2.4 days in the jejunum and 4.9 days in the ileum. Very, very different than that two days, at least, to which we think about and ascribe that to. So hopefully I'm changing your thoughts through this process. And it's imperative to understand this, essentially, as we think of these different challenges and what that maintenance cost to the tissue actually is. Now, back in the 1970s and 1980s, we began to try and understand the influence of subtherapeutic antibiotics and changes to how that bird becomes more efficient. And a lot of what we understand in terms of that gain in efficiency is due to lowering the level of microbial load and therefore lowering the turnover of that epithelial surface and therefore improving the efficiency and lessening the maintenance cost to that tissue. So if we look at Mary Coates back in 1980, and she did a number of different studies looking at conventionally reared animals versus those in a germ-free environment, one of the things to realize here in the bottom line, this is the percent of ileum traversed by those reared in a germ-free environment. The red line is that of birds that were conventionally reared. Obvious difference in at least and the same methodology of looking at the percentage of how far that labeled enterocyte had migrated along the crypt villus axis. In the conventional animals, we were looking at a replacement rate of about 26% per day, turnover of about 3.8 days, versus its germ-free counterpart taking nearly nine days to essentially turn over within the digestive tract or essentially a 10% turnover per day. A 2.4-fold difference 
just because of presence of microbes within the digestive tract. So let's fast forward a little bit to what we understand about presence of challenge. Again, I realize that this is not new literature, right? So this was back from 1973, but yet I think a lot of what we need to understand is really to fully encompass a lot of that literature and basis. So what Fernando and Macra saw back in 1973, they were using an Ameria servulina challenge. Again, Ameria servulina, for those of you that are unfamiliar, uh, tends to be pathogenic within the duodenum itself. And indeed, as we look at these challenges and turnover, really we were seeing a little bit over 30% turnover per day in the duodenum upon challenge versus 10% in the controls. But I think what was interesting was that that turnover, even though that tissue is not the one that typically is going to be infected, has an influence on turnover of the rest of the epithelia throughout the length of the gastrointestinal tract, even into the jejunum and into the ileum. Again, that tissue was responding in terms of trying to turn over and shed itself of an infected cell. Changes again to peristalsis, changes to turnover. Now, all of those changes then lead to changes in maintenance function. Bob Teeter, who retired from Oklahoma State University in the U.S., had one of the few metabolism chambers um, to essentially study what we know in terms of energetic use. And one of the things he went in was into non-challenged and challenged birds, went through and captured their maintenance energy needs upon challenge, went in then and looked at severity of that challenge then after the conducting the studies to ascertain whether they were subclinical lesions of what we term one or very clinical lesions. Now he did this to different pools of chickens at various different ages from 20 days of age up to 48 days of age. So the one thing I just wanted to include in this slide is the change in maintenance needs to that animal are quite significant. Again, based on severity of that challenge, one, going from non-infected to infected, you see the change in caloric needs on a daily basis. But two, think about this in terms of as that animal ages, the changes to those additional maintenance needs are going to increase quite dramatically because we have a bigger bird, a bigger digestive tract, and therefore changes to that overall load. That changes and impacts the global poultry industry differently, right? Whether you're rearing a two kilo or less bird versus us in the US in some cases rearing over a four plus kilo bird, right? So again, when that animal is challenged and having to respond to those challenges, that maintenance need may be very, very different. So as we look to other changes, again, as we ascribe changes to turnover, Part of what is relayed by that animal in terms of functionality will change as well. If that cell is not alive as much, it may not differentiate as much as some of its other counterparts that are around a lot longer. The example I wanted to give you here was really for that of intestinal carbohydrates. And I apologize because I'm using a mammalian example. Um, but theoretically, I wanted to present this, and then I'll give you some data from that of the bird. So we know as an example the, the time at to which that enterocyte is alive. It will ch take on different functions. In terms of intestinal carbohydrates, those cells further down the cryptvillus axis will produce more glucoamylase, then begin producing maltase, and farther along in their life, producing more sucrase and then lactase. So we know the dynamics to which, if you are challenged, the speed to which that cell is going through this process of differentiation. If it is not alive long enough, it may not produce some of those carbohydrates, which are, tend to be expressed more towards the top of the cryptvillus axis. And in the case of, say, a, a weanling pig experiencing um, different types of infection, whether it be clostridial or a viral infection, we know in many cases it is not uh, going to express as much lactase. Therefore, 
go through some secretory diarrhea as part of that process when that lactose enters into the hindgut and then we'll perpetuate some of that with that undigested lactose being present. Shahaba Uni back in the 1990s did, went through some very eloquent work in trying to look at those different fractions along the crib villus axis. So to set you up with these slides, she did these partial digestions from the crypt regions and collected fractions all the way to the villus tip, which is represented on the left half of this axis. She went in the, within each of those fractions, then should just look at maltase on the top graph and sucrase activity on the bottom graph. I think the important thing to understand from these, these two graphs really, and this is in a very healthy state, really is that those upper fractions of that villus really is expressing 30 to 40 percent more maltase and sucrase activity. So again, if that cell is not alive a long enough time to express these activities, we're going to also get a change in their differentiation state, what they are able to express, and then therefore affecting the digestibility of those nutrients as it progresses through the length of the digestive tract. Now we've talked about pathogens, but we have other things that challenge our animals as well one of which is oxidized fat. And I just wanted to present this because it is a non-pathogen type of change to the di dynamics of this particular system. So Julia Dibner did these studies back in the 1990s as well. Again, use a tritiated, actually in this case it was a, a thymidine analog at least that they were using. But you can see in those animals fed a control fat, um, they did not progress as far as those that had fed, been fed an oxidized fat. So non-nutritive or non-pathogen types of challenges can also change this dynamic within the digestive tract as well. Wanted to make sure that we went through some of these other types of changes. The other one at which I would like to talk of and changes to those responses is that of mucin production. We know that mucin is one of those that is very endogenously, uh, produces a, a large amount of endogenous cost to the animal. In the case of the pig, uh, we know that threonine encompasses about five to seven percent of endogenous amino acid losses in the chick. And uh, at least of that endogenous amino acid loss, 30 percent of that is as mucin if we look at the case of the pig. We have not necessarily quantified that in the case of the chick, but it should be easy to go back and do that. So why is mucin important? We know that it is the first line of defense. It becomes then home for na natural antimicrobials, secretory IgA, lysozyme, defensins, and it maintains tissue hydration, lubrication, and it, it really facilitates digestion. And the composition of that mucin is imperative to become residents for that, that microflora that has both positive effects on the digestive tract, but it's also a home then in those, the, that network or web, if you will, for pathogens. So we know, at least in terms of feeding different types of ingredients, relay different functions to that of mucin. The literature is pervasive with our understanding and that's partly why we have a number of different exogenous carbohydrates coming into the diet to, s to essentially change that level of viscosity presented to the digestive tract. In the case of feeding barley or wheat or those other cereals with high levels of non-starch polysaccharides. Now accounting for that response, becomes very interesting because we know that other compounds and giving other compounds can have an influence on that composition and how that responds in the environment of the intestinal tract. One of those compounds that we are understanding now has an influence on responses to production of mucin and also composition of that mucin is that of, of uh, some plant-based essential oils such as carvacrol and thymol. We know that one of the responses we can see is just an upregulation in terms of numbers of goblet cells. 
And one of the other studies that we did in our lab a number of years ago really was to looking at functional composition in different environments fed different cereals, whether it be corn or whether it be wheat. So the left three bars on this graph are corn fed animals. The right three are from wheat fed animals. Now we also supplemented in carbacrol or thymol to these animals and that's what you see with the second, third, and fourth or fifth and sixth bars with that, those graphs. The top graph is essentially log transcript of mucin 2, the muc 2, the primary secretory mucin. And what we see is that that predominant secretory mucin is transcriptionally regulated essentially by the essential oil thymol. But what was most interesting, if we look at the hydration state or the hydration capacity of this mucin, and as we would expect, the wheat-based diets versus the corn-based diets, we saw that it became more viscous or essentially not being able to hold as much water. Again, based to that, that uh, post-translational modification, that glycoprotein that is present. But I think what was interesting was that in the wheat-based diets, we were beginning to see some, some changes to that modification of that, that uh, mucin, allowing a little bit more water to be um, held into that mucin, and this again, without any enzyme being supplemented into the diet. So we can, and we're beginning to understand what that really means in terms of not only water holding capacity, but then what that relays at least on what microbiota can essentially live within that particular environment. And I mentioned mucin especially because we know that as we have removed subtherapeutic, subtherapeutic antibiotics from the diet, we have gone through a change to essentially what microbiota will live. Some of those microbiota, such as Clostridium perfringens, really favor and become mucolytic and try and have that intestine respond. So in the case of, of Clostridium perfringens, this is probably not a good thing because then they really upregulate and take advantage of that process and create the, the biofilm that is occurring. So we know that the, the gastrointestinal tract is chronically processing these antigens, and inherently it has quite a, a cost to the animal. If, it's you, if the microbiota get a hold of that carbohydrate, which in gross energy contents has four kcals per gram, and turn it into a volatile fatty acid at 2.8 kcals per gram, we've essentially lost 30% of that gross energy potential, right? It still can potentially utilize some of that VFA in the hindgut, but inherently we've lost the ability of that animal to recoup that differential in and of itself. So can we account for some of these challenges? I wanted to go back to this particular study again that I showed you earlier on. Again, this was a particular level of challenge, that being the 12 times normal dose of a coccidio vaccine. So our first question was, could we account for it from a dietary perspective to recoup some of that differential? And we just did this as a paper exercise because we had roughly a difference between 3,270 kcals per gram in the unchallenged birds and our metabolizable energy from our challenged birds was 1,785, a difference of nearly 1,500 kcals per kg. If we were to try to energetically account for that differential, we'd have to put about 18.5% fat in that diet. Not really practical, right? So the other, back to the amino acid side, we question, could we actually account for the amino acid side alone? We know we maybe could not do that from an energetic perspective. The question was, could we do that from an amino acid digestibility standpoint? So we created a, a second experiment, same type of challenge, to which we supplemented that differential in standardized digestibility by adding an additional lysine, methionine, threonine, isoleucine, tryptophan, isoleucine, and valine. I think the thing that to point out was that we were unable to account for this in terms of body weight. We did pick up a little bit of body weight differential, but not completely to the unchallenged controls. However, if we look at the feed conversion, we were able to get it in between the challenge birds with the supplemental level. It picked up a little bit of efficiency, um, statistically not different than the unchallenged controls. 
Um, but we did pick up a little bit. So in essence, it helped, but only a partial gain in that terms of response. But again, it becomes very difficult from a nutritional standpoint to, again, try and predict how much of that challenge is the bird going to be exposed with, how virulent that challenge is, and what is our understanding then of that individual's response, which we know is different in the terms of the digestive tract and across different animals within the population. I'm going to skip through these and really go to my take home messages. Um, the thing I wanted to leave you with today really was that the gastrointestinal tract is adaptive to the environment that it is exposed to in terms of ingredient matrix, but also in terms of that bacterial environment to which it is, is um, exposed to. And those exposure to different environments will alter the potential maintenance cost as well as that nutrient and energy digestibility capabilities that that tissue has. The other thing I wanted to relay in prediction of that, really those three things again, that ad adaptation and type of response in terms of pathogen really is the amount of pathogen, the virulence of that pathogen, and other predisposing factors that relay the capabilities of response. And lastly, that immunological response, which we'll hear a little bit later on, um, and that recovery from response can really vary the nutrient and energy needs in terms of efficiency and overall changes to maintenance function of that tissue. So with that, I'd love to turn it back to our, uh, our chair for today, Dr. Kashat. Gerhard says that we can ask, you can ask one or two quick questions. So the question is, what types of parameters were measured after injection of the tritiated thymidine? So I've done a number of these different studies, and what they were measuring, essentially, if they're doing tritiated thymidine, they're measuring the, the um, using autoradiography through histology and essentially looking at where that labeled cell actually is. So the tricky part about this is it will only incorporate into those cells that are going through mitotic division, right? So this is the main thing. They're looking at histology, looking to see where that leading edge of that labeled cell is along that cryptophilus axis. There are some assumptions you have to make with that. Uh, one of those assumptions is where is that cell when it originally was labeled? We know that some work from, from my lab when I was early on in my career, as well as the uh, Jehava Uni in Israel, is the cells can undergo mitotic division at different places along that cryptophilus axis. Typically, we think they're down in the crypt region in and of themselves, but that's the main parameter that they're looking, and then just measuring distance, if you will, of how far it had traversed along that cryptophilus axis. Thank you very much.